Well, good evening, and thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be speaking to you this evening. Uh, I'm not sure I would describe that as a warm-up act, actually. Very impressive and eloquent speakers this evening. Um, the topic I'd like to talk to you about is diversity, and specifically the Rose Review, which was recently published, focusing on how we can help female entrepreneurs in the UK succeed. As a country, we recently celebrated the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. So women in the workplace and the topic of diversity is something at the forefront of many of our minds. The UK actually scores very highly in international indices of female entrepreneurship. When you look at the environment, the ecosystem, and the aspirations of women. That's been helped by the UK's open, business-friendly environment and our focus on innovation. That's a subject that is very close to my heart. I'm a director of innovation and of strategy at RBS and NatWest. So personally, I've worked in financial services for over 20 years. I started my career at Goldman Sachs in New York and then moved across to London. And I came home to Edinburgh to work as a director at Standard Life Investments. I spent the last 12 years at RBS NatWest in a, a range of leadership roles across the group. And during that time, I've walked the journey of a young and now slightly more mature woman building her career in banking, learning how to navigate different companies, different teams, and different roles, while at the same time juggling family commitments. I've seen great changes in how women operate within financial services over the last 20 years, and I've seen great advancements. Tonight, I'll share with you my thoughts on the overall topic of diversity, but also my own personal learnings on what I have seen work well. I'm someone who fundamentally believes in appointing people into positions on the basis of merit. A key lesson I learned at the start of my career at Goldman Sachs is that diversity in people is a good thing because it encourages diversity of thought. The most important voice to listen to in a room has nothing to do with seniority, with background, or with gender. It has to do with ability. I've carried that lesson throughout my career, and I've learned actively to seek out different points of views and diverse opinions. What I have seen is that introducing more female and more diverse voices changes the conversation. It stops groupthink and it broadens your mindset. That's good for business and it's good for customers. So where are we starting from today? In the UK and in Scotland, we've already achieved a lot and we have much to be proud of. Women don't lack ambition and they certainly don't lack ability. But we're not yet where we need to be. There's a lot more to be done, as can be demonstrated by the fact that men named Dave or David equal the number of women in FTSE 100 CEO roles. Now, I'm a mother of both a son and a daughter, neither of whom are called Dave or David, but it is quite a sobering statistic. I say that with caution, having been invited here by David May. Um, but I do think things are changing due to lots of hard work by individuals, by companies, by institutes like yours. There is a marked shift. Sectors like banking are changing. This shift has been achieved, due no doubt to many people here this evening, through your focus on diversity and inclusion in financial services in the UK. I see it myself. In my day-to-day -day work, the executive committee I sit on is now 50-50 men and women. It was about 70-30 when I first joined that committee a number of years ago, but that has changed to an even balance because it is led by a chief executive who has stepped forward to drive diversity across his organization. It's one of the many reasons that I work for Les Matheson. He fundamentally believes in the power of diversity to drive better business and better customer outcomes. Alison Rose is our Deputy Chief Executive, and she recently 
led a review on behalf of the UK government into female entrepreneurship. The goal of that review was to understand the disparity between men and women in entrepreneurship and identify the barriers that face female entrepreneurs when they start their businesses or they want to scale it up. The report uncovered some very stark findings, but it also showed that the prize is huge. Up to 250 billion pounds worth of new value could be added to the UK economy if women started and scaled their businesses at the same rate as men. That is equivalent to around four years of natural economic growth. So this evening, I would like to cover three things. Firstly, my perspective on why diversity and inclusion matter and what we're doing about it, RBS. Secondly, the Rose Review into female entrepreneurship. And thirdly, and most importantly, really, a call to action and what everyone in this room and as professionals and members of this institute can do to make a difference in diversity and inclusion and make it a reality across all of our companies. So why would diversity and inclusion matter to a large institution like RBS? All the research demonstrates there's a direct correlation between a diverse leadership team and financial performance, including value creation. But it's not just gender that's important on diversity. McKinsey carried out a big research study last year, you might have read it, that showed that companies in the top quartile for ethnic and cultural diversity are 33% more likely to have industry-leading profitability. So if you care about profitability and you care about revenue, and I'm pretty sure everyone in this room does because it's pretty vital to society, you need a gender-diverse team. If you care about understanding and meeting the needs of your customers, and again, I really hope that's the case, you need a diverse team. To me, it's really simple. If you take a group of like-minded individuals from the same background, broadly speaking, they will think and act alike. They won't challenge each other and necessarily bring fresh perspectives. And also, most importantly, they won't represent the customer base that you serve. More diverse teams come up with more creative solutions. And who wouldn't want that? Quite frankly, we need creativity and innovation in this country, and we need it to come from the diversity of thought in order to keep up with that rapidly changing world around us. We've talked about technology tonight. I live in innovation. There is so much coming. And nowhere is the culture change in RBS starker than in that approach to diversity. In order to serve our customers well, which is our purpose, we need to make sure they're represented at all levels in our institution. I and the other leaders within the bank want to be known as the bank that represents everybody in society. Inclusion is really about making sure everyone can bring the best of themselves to work every single day. And creating a culture where people can be their true selves, knowing they're in a safe environment to do that. If we're a more inclusive place to work, great people will want to work with us and more customers will want to bank with us. So it really is a business priority. Inclusion helps us understand and connect with our diverse customer base, resulting in us being better at giving customers what they really need. But there's more than just a business case for inclusion. It's the right thing to do. It's true to our values and the bank that we want to be. This isn't new for us. At RBS, we've been leading the way on gender inclusivity in banking for a number of years. We've recognized its importance and we've been proactive in our approach to building stronger, gender-balanced talent pipelines. We've set ourselves bold targets, not just for diversity at the top of the shop, but right the way through the organization. And we currently have an aim to have a fully gender-balanced workforce by 2030. We're taking real action to support women through development, networking, and performance support. We deliver unconscious bias training. We've now done that to 80% of all of our employees. We've got training programs tailored for women in business, and we've introduced new programs like Come Back. That's not just for women, actually. It's developed specifically to retain people who've had a break from work and are looking to return. I could go on. There has been and continues to be a huge amount of focus on this across our organization. 
Our women's network is vast, it is very active, and it is very vocal. Uh, they're in the business every day, championing that cause, often voluntarily, to help build a better and brighter future for the other generation of women that are coming in to that workplace. But it's not just women within the organization that we're committed to supporting, it's also our female customers. We have 400 women in business specialists among our frontline bankers. They're accredited by the Chartered Banker Institute and they're certified by every woman. These specialists offer bespoke mentoring, networking and professional business advice to women-led and owned SMEs. And every year we host nearly 300 events across the UK that reach nearly 11,500 female entrepreneurs. That tailor support has helped us see a 30% increase in the percentage of new business banking accounts which are for women-led businesses. To put that in context, we increased our support and lending to female customers by 7.5% last year, and earlier this year, we announced we have £150 million worth of pre-approved lending limits out to our existing female customers. We have proactively contacted them to see if we can give them additional funding to help them grow their businesses quicker and further. All of this, and much more, has earned us a place in the Times Top 50 Best Places for Women to Work list every year for the last 11 years. I'm really proud of that. But getting a more diverse representation across all levels of the bank has been, and it continues to be, challenging. We're making significant progress, but we've got further to go. In 2013, we set an aspiration to have 30% senior women in our top 5,000 roles by 2020. We've actually already exceeded that aspiration. The proportion of women in our top 5,000 roles is 44%. As a result of this, at the end of 2014, we thought, let's be more ambitious. So we set our formal target to have at least 30% of women in the top three leadership layers in each of our businesses by 2020. We chose 30% because it marks the statistical tipping point where female contributions influence teams enough to change behavior and change culture. We're currently at 37% on aggregate, and we're confident we'll meet that target in all our business areas. The most ambitious thing about that target isn't that we introduced it, it's that it applies to each business area, and that's important. It's unusual, actually, because it means we won't just take the representation in an aggregate number, we want the commercial and the private bank to be just as diverse as the personal bank, but if they're not, we'll be held to account. Furthermore, we've also been public about our aspiration to have that fully gender balanced workforce by 2030. And since we started working on fair gender representation across the bank, it's fair to say that's where we're furthest along, but we want to take those learnings and those mechanisms and apply them to new areas. So about 14% of the UK working population is BAMI yet they hold 6% of the top management positions. Around 310,000 BAMI SMEs in the UK contribute 25 billion pounds to the UK economy. And the UK's BAMI population is set to grow by 20% by 2030. So you can't continue with those current levels of underrepresentation. Within the bank, 15% of our UK-based colleagues who choose to disclose their ethnicity are BAMI. It's about 1% higher than the UK census number. But as I look up our organization, our data tells us only 4% of our top three leadership layers and 8% of that top 5,000 I talked to you about come from BAMI backgrounds. So following the approach that we applied to gender representation, we've now introduced bank-wide public targets to have 14% of BAMI colleagues in our leadership population by 2025. And that's the number that mirrors the UK working population statistic. It's the first time we've introduced these kind of targets in the bank, and we hope that it will help address that historic imbalance. Improving representation is only one part of our approach to diversity. We're also supporting our diverse employees, upskilling them with bespoke training and mentoring opportunities for these groups. There is a huge amount I could talk to you about in this subject. It's a key focus area for us as an institution. Just recently, actually, we opened up our uh, employee partner medical benefits for employees in same-sex relationships. We're one of the first companies in the UK to do that. 
And all the work that we've done in this area is starting to get recognized, which helps build up standards across the industry. In March last year, we were awarded a gold rating by the Business Disability Forum. That's a really amazing result, as she came a year ahead of plan, and it puts us in the top three scores ever recorded in that benchmark. We've also retained a place in Stonewall's top 100 employers for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans employees. We've been on that index for over a decade. We're one of five employers and the only financial services organization to have that track record. So I hope all of these examples and the evidence of the public targets, which we hold ourselves to account to, have shown you that diversity and inclusion is something we take really seriously at RBS for the benefit of all of our stakeholders. We have been, and we continue to be, focused on this for the long term. So now I'd like to talk to you about women in business, and specifically the Rose Review. This review into female entrepreneurship was based on extensive research. It drew in over 50 previous reports and more than 200 in-depth interviews and workshops with entrepreneurs and business leaders, as well as looking at international best practice and surveying over 5,000 people. The findings are stark, and they reveal the current position to be unacceptable. Female businesses are 44% of the size of a male-led business. Male-led businesses are five times more likely to scale up. Only one in three, country, three entrepreneurs are female, compared to best-in-class countries, which have female entrepreneurship levels of over 40%. And perhaps most starkly, women currently receive less than 1% of venture capital, and on average have starting capital that is 50% less than those of men. They're also less aware of the funding options that they have. It's the single biggest opportunity and the number one barrier that we as a group need to smash down. This review has proved what we all suspected, that the unrealized potential for the UK economy caused by the disparity between male and female entrepreneurs is considerable. Up to 250 billion pounds worth could be added to the UK economy if women started and scaled new businesses at the same rate as men. That's your four years of natural economic growth. So in response to the review, the Prime Minister set out the government's ambition to increase the number of female entrepreneurs by 50% to create another 600,000 female entrepreneurs by 2030. The report identifies three clear opportunities. The first is to increase funding directed towards female entrepreneurs. The second is to make entrepreneurship more accessible for women. Increase your local support, relatable, accessible mentors and networks, breaking down cultural barriers in the areas around risk, perceptions of confidence, just knowing the right sponsor, knowing the right network. And the third is greater family care support for female entrepreneurs. Family responsibilities disproportionately affect female entrepreneurs all the way through their company journey. One of the areas of focus <clears throat> is that banks as a sector can do to support female entrepreneurship. So we're working with the other major banks to agree a female entrepreneur's code, along with collating key funding data to outline where we are in the support of female entrepreneurs, but also ensure that best practice is applied by all the financial institutions and all the public sector partners, creating that benchmark. But we can't wait for that to go off the ground. We were delighted to announce the launch of Back Her Business Programme. It's the first female-only crowdfunding programme that will support would-be entrepreneurs across the UK. It will help women get to that business starting line. Most of the funding will come from the crowd, but RBS will provide an annual funding top-up and we will offer up to 50% of an entrepreneur's fundraising target. So what are my thoughts on what all of us here today as professionals, and as Institute members can do to drive this agenda forward. There are three areas I would call out. The first, for those of us in leadership positions, is to push to make sure that diversity and inclusion is an integral part of your business strategy. I am a director of strategy, and I am the first one to say, 
strategy is 10% ideation and it is 90% execution. You have to have the right diverse team to implement your strategy for it to actually deliver and really succeed. People are your most important assets. The correlation with an organization's ability to outperform its peers when it is diverse is, is clear. Don't underestimate how inclusion can help connect you with your existing customers and bring in new customers. It results in being better able to understand what they actually want and need and serve them. We should be pulling together to ensure the most talented people are drawn to financial services because it offers an industry where they can be their true selves, knowing they're in a safe environment to express their views and their opinions. The second is to ensure you have a clear, systematic program of activity in place to drive diversity and inclusion across and down into your business. But don't make it window dressing. Make it real. And then feel how it helps move forward the culture of your organization. Take clear action to support women and underrepresented groups through development, networking, and performance support. You don't need to start from scratch. Many of you are already well into this journey, but don't be afraid to learn from what other organizations are doing and bring it into your business. There's some really strong case studies out there of how organizations have transformed themselves due to a focus on diversity and inclusion. There is so much we can all learn from each other in this space. And lastly, and most importantly, be bold and be public in the aspirations you have for your business in this area. As I outlined, in 2013, we set our public aspiration to have 30% senior women in our top 5,000 roles by 2020. And we chose that 30% because that is the tipping point where those female contributions influence teams enough to change behavior and culture. Over the last three years, we've met that aspiration. We're pushing beyond it. We're now at 44% in our top 5,000 roles. And we've also been public about that next aspiration to have a fully gender balanced workforce. Some areas are working towards full gender balance even quicker. And we're now applying those same learnings, same principles, same practices to our BAMI agenda. And we're doing it publicly. The reality is what gets measured gets done. So ask yourself this question. What will your public targets be for your business? on diversity and inclusion, and how can you make sure that you reach them? In closing, the focus on diversity and inclusion isn't just because it's the right thing to do, and something which I'm sure aligns with all of our values. Hopefully that argument is now settled. Instead, it's how we'll together build a sustainable culture of diversity and inclusion for our industry for the future an industry that reflects the communities in which we operate and those people that we serve. An industry that brings together diversity of thought to build the best possible solutions for our customers. And it's not just the future of financial services we have the opportunity to change. By building a more inclusive workforce, we're ultimately helping to build a more inclusive society. The broader public interest in such an achievement is clear. The commitment and drive has to come from the top, with a public and preferably bold commitment to the inclusion and diversity agenda. However, it needs to be cascaded through your organization and drive it through all layers of leadership and management. You have to role model that behavior and the culture and hold individuals accountable for its delivery. We're making huge strides forward in all of these three areas, and I hope tonight I have made the case for us all working together to push these boundaries even further for the benefit of our employees, our companies, and most importantly, for our customers. To close with a favorite quote of mine from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you.
Okay, I think we've got some time for questions. I know we're slightly overrunning, and there's a very glamorous uh, conservatory behind me full of wine. But if any of you have any questions, really happy to take them uh, on any of that subject matter. We've got some roving mics as well, just to make sure we can be heard. Lynn, here at the front, in her new role. <laughs> don't always need a mic, but very conscious um, of, of colleagues and friends on the webcast. Um, fantastic, Georgina, thank you. Um, I guess my kind of question, I'm, I'm still struck that you know so much of innovation driven by the technology discipline or digital yeah. disciplines, and they, they often can still be areas where there's quite a heavy male bias. Yeah. Um, have you kind of come across where that's still creating perhaps almost quite systemic issues in terms of bias that might be going into mm -hmm. AI design or in our credit scoring? Is, is that something that, that you've been wrestling with? It's a fascinating question, actually. So um, I have the most amazing job because I get to think about strategy and I also get to think about innovation. So even last year, I went out to visit the big tech companies in China, and I have a big focus on artificial intelligence, which is what Lynn is touching on. <clears throat> One thing I would definitely say about artificial intelligence and machine learning and all of these wonderful new technologies that offer the opportunity to help humanity is that they are only as good uh, as the data you put in. So if you feed in bias, you're going to get bias out. And we saw that with the, the Google AI Assistant. Right? It had to be taken off because it just started feeding itself uh, things that were not aligned to people's values. So I think it's a really interesting question. I think in terms of the feeder into the industry, if I start with that part of your question, I think we need to look across society, and you actually almost have to start with children. So if you think of the STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering, maths, um, historically women just haven't been as drawn to that. Actually, it's really important. And there was this brilliant report that Microsoft published last year, um, and they surveyed um, children in America and they found that over 70% of children wanted to do something with their life that had a purpose. That's a big thing. It's a big theme you see now, particularly in people coming in. I'm sure you see it in the Institute, people coming into their careers. There's a lot more focus now on making a difference to society and purpose with your life. So 70% of kids said, I want to do this, much more important to me than money or any of these other things. And then when, when they were asked, you know, which careers do you think would make a difference to society? Less than 20% thought any of the STEM subjects would even touch it which can't be right. So there's a bit for me about narrative and role modeling. So um, we need to help children understand that actually getting those skills and getting those technology skills, those science skills, those engineers, is almost the best possible way in the future, probably, that you can make a really great difference, along with the creative arts. So I think there's a very important piece there about bringing people with you. I think role modeling is really important. We've done some great programs. Um, there's a lovely lady who works at the bank called Wincy Wong, who is amazing. You might have seen her on LinkedIn. She's very um, active on social media. And she worked with some friends and went to the government and set up this fantastic um, program um, called Tech She Can. And women come and they learn about technology and they get involved and it's really exciting. And even on a small scale, I run a coding club at the bank on a Friday afternoon so kids can come and learn to code. And I think it's just more and more of that pulling people through. And in terms of bias within technology, I think it is something we have to be extremely cautious and careful with. I think it's an excellent point. So you have to edit the data that goes in and you have to continually cleanse it. Because whatever way you build your algorithms, you have to constantly make sure that that data is not biased. And then the point that Lynn's perfectly making is, but what if the data scientists who are cleansing the data are biased? <laughs> so it can get a little torturous in the tautology, but um, it's a very important point, uh, which is one of the reasons that we have a three line of defense model, actually, and, and that's a, a good tool in that environment. Thank you, Lynn. Hi. Bill. You might, are you mic'd up? I don't know if yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, you're preempted, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm interested in the uh, merit point. Mm -hmm. So about 10, 12 years ago, I was chairing a board in Norway, and there was a government change, and the quota system for females on listed company boards yeah. came in. So overnight, on this particular board, uh, within, I think we had six weeks, but two people were up for the job physically, and okay. we had to change. Now, at that point in time, there was a view that this quota thing is all wrong, because okay. it's simply placeholders, tokenism, and everything else. But here we are 12 years later, and the individuals who joined those boards, and it was diversity around male-female mm -hmm. in those days, they've now got 10 years of data where they've had moderation of behavior on boards. Mm. Now, the Norwegian model isn't uh, quite as American or British, yeah. where there's gum ho and whatever. They're, they're much more moderated. Uh, just because of social circumstances. But I'm just wondering in your comments around 
the merit thing about mm. seeking the talent as opposed to a particular group or whatever. Um, and have you, or would you look at the Norwegian evidence now that's actual 10 years of doing data now? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that, that data statistically also um, exists in the Netherlands, in the UK, in America, in Canada in particular, actually. They're amazing at, at diversity and inclusion. I spent some time working in Canada when I was at Standard Life. It's actually a really interesting country to work in. Um, I suppose my perspective is that, you know, there's a part of me that says, why would you need a quota? But experience tells me you do. Yeah. And I've seen it. I've seen it the whole way through my career. And, you know, I, I get that people can be a little bit allergic around it and say, I don't want stuff that's forced, you know, I want things to come. But the reality is that men and women are different. They are different in their approach to risk. They are different in their approach to confidence. Simple things. You know, I see it a lot in the bank because I do a huge amount of mentoring. Uh, some of my mentees are here tonight, actually. Um, and actually, people will often, a woman in particular, will say, well, gosh, Georgina, I can't apply for that job. I don't have 100% of the qualifications. And the chap sitting next to her is like, oh, it's fine, go on, love. <laughs> and I make that joke lightly, but actually it's a really key thing because if you take a little bit of risk all the way through your career, it's like Logan's run. You move it by 1% and you will end up in a different place. So the Norwegians decided they had to move the needle. Right. They, did, they didn't want quotas because they wanted tokenism. They said, we have to do something. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if that's we should consider subscribing to just to get it done. I have definitely seen it work very powerfully, and I have seen it work over 20 years. I think um, even like simple examples like shortlists, just yeah. always make sure you have a proportion of female and diverse, it's not just about gender, candidates on there. Yeah. Because it's, it's that you know, blink Malcolm Gladwell model. It will force your mind to think differently and pick up things that, that your subconscious bias might not. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, Not at all. Do you want the microphone? It's up to you. <laughs> um, well, one question I have is, um, for the last three years, we've run research on pay and diversity and inclusion across yeah. our membership base. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and obviously, we are um, delighted that most of our, our members, actually the majority, are, are female members. Um, and what we can see is that the industry is making great strides in diversity and inclusion um, at recruitment mm -hmm. and entry level. Yeah. And that's reflected across those who take our initial foundation qualification. Great. However, we haven't yet seen that in progression. So when it comes to more senior qualifications, mm -hmm. um, the tendency as, as we move up, just like any other business, mm -hmm. um, we get fewer and fewer women who take um, progressive qualifications or higher level qualifications. And I'm just wondering if there's something as an institute that we can do to support organizations like RBS and others to understand what they could do differently or what we can give them information on potentially to help them with those choices and, and help people understand how that can help their career over time. I think that's, a, that's, that's really interesting, actually. I, you know, look, my overall observation would be that often, um, this is a little bit of a generalisation, but bear with me, uh, is that my female colleagues are so busy with their heads down working that they're not always looking forward and thinking, actually, maybe that qualification would help move that dial, or maybe actually in two jobs' time, I should, I should upskill on that now. Um, I don't think there's any particular reason that that should be the case, but it is. And it can sometimes be because they are um, primary, primarily looking after a family or juggling multiple things. Actually, the truth is it applies to both genders in terms of I think many of us now are dealing with children and aged parents. You know, it's a busy life. Um, so I would suggest uh, it's really about education and visibility. So if you do that qualification, what does that what does it give you? I love learning, so I'm probably not a great case study because I love studying and I love learning new things all the time, all the way through my career. I've, I've done such diverse jobs because I just love learning you know, new skills. So um, I think it's really about education and maybe a bit about promotion in terms of how you're talking about yourselves. It was fascinating to hear about your 2025 project and, and talking to John earlier about you know, going out into schools and helping people that wouldn't naturally come into financial services to come into it. You know, is that widely known? Are you talking about it? Are you talking about your review into the future of banking and technology? I'm sure you are. But, you know, I think there's great opportunities in, you know, your subject matter and in the things that you're making a difference in to um, talk about it more in the community. I would encourage that. Does that help? Does that make sense? Thank you.
All right, I'm conscious of time. <laughs> Would you, one last question? No, you good? Okay, well look, thank you all very much for your engagement and listening uh, so patiently and kindly to my speech. I will be here this evening, so if you would like to um, talk to me in a less formal setting, then please do. And I would like to very much thank the Institute for inviting me to speak this evening. It's been a real pleasure uh, and to meet you all, so thank you very much. <laughs>